right, that'll help. Amen. It's good to be in the house of God this morning and study the Word. Father, give me the gift of teaching, Lord, and then give the folks ears to hear and a heart that's receptive. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, now, if you have your Bible, would you turn to the book of Acts chapter 28? Acts chapter number 28. And I'm going to bring you up to date on what we've talked about, especially last week. Acts chapter number 28 and verse number 25. Acts 28, 25. And when they agreed not among themselves, they departed. After that Paul had spoken one word, well spake the Holy Ghost by Esaias, the prophet unto our fathers, saying unto this people, and saying, and say, saying, go unto this people and say, hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see and not perceive. For the heart of this people is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. Be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles, and that they will hear it. Now I want to ask you one question. Had Gentiles been saved before Acts chapter number 28? Of course they had. But what's happening here is a decree. It's a change in something. Now if you remember I told you last week that the book of Acts covers a period of time all the way up until right before the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, 70 A.D. Now we know that uh, the temple was destroyed because it's in secular history. Uh, secular history, secular science, secular archaeology and all the rest of it will never contradict the scripture. You'll never find that. You will find science falsely so called. The hallucinations of men where it will contradict the word of God. So the Bible says that in the book of Acts chapter number 28 something is happening. If you remember last week I told you how that when the Apostle Paul was saved <clears throat> he was saved uh, literally separate apart from the, uh, any, any part with the church. He wasn't in a church meeting. He wasn't in a revival meeting or anything of that nature. The fact of the matter is he was on his, on his way to Damascus, one of the oldest cities in the world, still inhabited Damascus. That's where they're fighting right now. On his way to Damascus to take any of that way. That's what they were called at that time. They weren't called Christians until later in Antioch. But any of that way bound back to Jerusalem and he was personally responsible to see them uh, executed. He was a murderer. But God met him and saved him on the road to Damascus because he was a chosen vessel unto the Lord. Two basic seats of authority existed at that moment. One basic seat of authority was in Jerusalem under James the Just who wrote the book of James and the elders. The other seat of authority was the Apostle Paul himself, one man. Uh, in the wisdom of God, he had a reason for doing it that way. When he revealed the mystery that we're going to be talking about here in a little while, he revealed it to one man, one man. And that man he appointed as the Apostle to the Gentiles. He called Peter the Apostle of the Circumcision and Paul the Apostle of the Uncircumcision. And God, in His wisdom, never makes a mistake. And when He chooses to do something, He does it right the first time. Amen. So in the book of Acts, chapter number 28, something has happened. The Scripture talks about two things that relate to the Gentiles. One is the times of the Gentiles, and the other is the fullness of the Gentiles. The times of the Gentiles started in 606 B.C., during the time of Israel's Babylonian captivity, the third chapter of Daniel records a gold or a huge image, not gold all the way, but a head of gold, chest of silver, midsection of brass, legs of iron, feet of iron and clay. 
Nebuchadnezzar had a vision of this. He saw it in a dream. None of his wise men or soothsayers or sorcerers or any of the rest of them could interpret it, but Daniel could. Daniel's name means God Elohim is judge, or El is judge, Daniel. Dan in Hebrew means judge. The northernmost tribes of Israel were in Dan. The southernmost tribes of Israel were in Beersheba, or the, or the uh, well of the oath of the sheep, Beersheba. So Daniel is the book of God's judgment, and he used a pagan country to judge his people. He has that way of doing things. Daniel was the only one who was able to interpret the dream, the vision that Nebuchadnezzar had. That dream or that vision represented the times of the Gentiles beginning with Nebuchadnezzar all the way down to the present time. The Gentiles, therefore, would be supreme and they would rule over the Jews. And they have. They have. All the way down until a rock or stone cut out of a mountain without hands, smites that image not on its head, not on its chest, not on its midsection, not on its legs, but on its feet. In other words, in the final manifestation of the times of the Gentiles, we have an anomaly. We have, we have something that just doesn't work. It's something that is contrived. It's a man-made thing. What's that? That's iron and clay. They don't mix. You can't mix them. It does not happen. Yet it is a reality. And what does that represent? That represents the last stage of the Gentile kingdom. That's where you are now. And you are at that point because we are in the end stage of the times of the Gentiles. But that kingdom will come to an abrupt end. All of a sudden, the stone cut out of a mountain, which represents the Lord Jesus, for he is the stone, will smite that image on its feet, and when it smites that image on its feet, the destruction will be absolute and complete and immediate. It will come to an end. And that's what happens with the Gentile kingdoms. It's up to us to interpret when that takes place. There's usually not a problem with Christians in, uh, in observing and recognizing facts. The problem comes when they begin to interpret those facts. The interpretation is where the uh, devilment comes in, you see. So when does the Gentile kingdoms come to an end? Well, it's for certain that they haven't ended yet, do you believe? Not yet, but they will end. The Gentile kingdoms will come to a quick end. I believe by interpretation that that happens when the stone cut out of the mountain smites that image. It comes in belligerence. It comes in power. He comes in might and he comes in glory when he comes at the second advent, when he comes as the king of kings and lord of lords. As king of kings, the Gentile kingdoms will come to an end. As lord of lords, he takes possession of that which he owns rightfully. So he will smite that image on its feet and it will come to an abrupt end. The times of the Gentiles, therefore the Lord talks about in the Gospel of Luke, will happen at the end, I believe, of what's called the time of Jacob's trouble or the tribulation period. Of great tribulation, he said, and he said of that time, except it be cut short. No flesh should be left alive. Using, statement like, using statements like that, speaking in that kind of language, that helps me to understand that nothing like that has happened previous to this. But when it does happen, it will be severe. It will be horrible for the earth. And that's the time of uh, the tribulation period, the great tribulation that's coming upon the, all, upon the earth. The fullness of the Gentiles has to do with the fact that when the last Gentile, and I believe probably more than likely this is the interpretation, there's a lot of different interpretations, but when the last Gentile comes in to make up the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, the Gentile brought in, then the fullness has, uh, has been satisfied, the fullness of the Gentiles. The Gentiles, believe it or not, are still dependent upon the Jews. They are, <clears throat> they, and they will. it will be manifested most of all in the tribulation. Why? 144,000 male Jews, which are virgins, will preach the everlasting gospel. We notice how in chapter 7 they're on earth, then in chapter 14 they're gone and they're up in heaven. That tells us that something happens during the tribulation period that removes them from the earth and puts them in heaven. 
Probably it synchronizes with happen, what happens in Revelation 11 when the two witnesses whose bodies have lain in the street of Jerusalem for three days, their heads come back on them, we believe, because we believe they're decapitated, and they stand up and they're caught up because we hear the same terminology, come up hither, that we find in Revelation chapter 4, and they're caught up into the presence of the Lamb, probably Moses and Elijah. So a rapture, if you please, takes place during the tribulation period somewhere, and I believe more than likely about midways through the tribulation because of the counting of days that we find. Now, I know I've covered a lot of ground with you, but I'm doing this to kind of refresh your mind as to where we are. If you'll remember, they knew when Christ would be born if they believed in the 70 weeks of Daniel's prophecy. Daniel not only prophesies of the first coming of Christ, he prophesies of the second coming of Christ. Daniel covers both comings, first and second. That's why the book of Daniel is hated so much by liberal so-called theologians, because the book of Daniel is one powerful book. It talks about the rise of the Antichrist and his enemies, and he will have enemies. He will not have absolute control over the earth. He will have those who will come against him. So the book of Daniel deals with the first coming and the second coming. In the first coming, 69 weeks of Daniel's prophecy have been fulfilled. One week is left. That's the 70th week of Daniel. And I'm sure many of you in studying the Bible and reading commentaries and so forth have had it referred to as the tribulation period. Daniel's 70th week is the period of the great tribulation, which is true. That's what it is. That's what I believe it is. That's yet future. But you can be certain of this. If God fulfilled 69 weeks of it in the birth, ministry, and death, and resurrection of His Son, He will fulfill the 70th week of it. He will certainly do that. And that's going to happen. That's going to happen. So the 70 weeks could therefore, the magi, that's what they were, that's, what, that's the word in the text, magi, that's translated wise men, that came from the east. Uh, they saw His star in the west, and they followed that star. <coughs> A false, uh, not false, well, I don't know what you'd call him, Balaam in the Old Testament, prophesied of that star that would rise and uh, it would be the star of Israel. He talked about the coming of the Lord Jesus in the Old Testament text. He came. Now, here's the issue that we've been studying. What about that second coming? What about the second coming of Christ? If you'll remember, last week I told you how that the formation of the New Testament canon took place all the way up to the last book last chapter of the book of Acts, leaving only one book to be written after the closure of the book of Acts. And what was that? Revelation. It was written somewhere between 90 and 95 A.D. under the reign of Domitian, written by the Apostle John while he was exiled on the Isle of Patmos. That closed the canon of Scripture. It's very important to understand that most of all heresy, most of the, of the garbage that you hear in the Da Vinci Code and all this other stuff that's coming out today does not have its roots in the canon of Scripture. Its root is in pseudepigraphic writings, apocryphal books, Gnostic Gospels, and all this junk out there that's outside the 66 books of the Bible. And there's a bunch of, there's more stuff outside the Bible than there is in the Bible. Oh my goodness, it, it numbers in the hundreds. All of these so-called apocryphal books, pseudepigraphic, pseudo simply means false writings. You have the Old Testament, you have the apocrypha that goes between Malachi and Matthew, books like First and Second Maccabees, Ezra, Judith, Bell and the Dragon. These are apocryphal books that go between Malachi and Matthew in the so-called 400 silent years. They have a lot of truth in them. They are the Jewish apocryphal books. But you've also got apocryphal books that show up in North Africa, Around Philo, you've got Nag Hammadi, where they in 46 or 47, they dug up all this stuff. North Africa, which were Gnostic Gospels. They've got these other apocryphal books that have been popping up here, popping up there, being written within the first, second centuries after Christ, purporting to be Moses himself speaking, purporting to be Enoch speaking, and uh, purporting to be the apostles speaking. And that's what these books are about. And that gives them credibility, you see. Thus saith Moses. <laughs> Well, if Moses has something to say, let's hear what he has to say. Well, Moses didn't write any books except the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, as far as it goes. 
The reason I put that out there is because all the people out there making millions of dollars with a bunch of yarns and lies base it on garbage that's outside the Bible. So what do you do as a Bible believer? Well, you wouldn't give it, you wouldn't give it a flipping of your finger. You wouldn't, you, wouldn't give, you wouldn't give it a second thought. It means nothing. There's no authority in it. The Scripture is the authority. So in the book of Acts, the last chapter is a transitional thing that is moving from something to something. And it's very important. Now note carefully. The apostle says in Acts 28, I go unto the Gentiles. See this? Let's, let's look at it. Verse 28, Acts 28, 28. Be it known therefore to you that the salvation of God is sent unto who now? The Gentiles, and they will hear it. Now hold your place there and go back here to the book of Matthew chapter number 10. Verse 5, Matthew 10, 5. All right, here's Levi, and here's what he says. Being inspired of God, he's without error. That's what inspiration means. These twelve G Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not. Now let's compare the two. 65, 66, 67, 68 A.D., somewhere in there. The Apostle Paul says that God, the salvation of God is sent to the Gentiles and that they will hear it. All right. Now put your thinking cap on for a minute. What's going on? When the Lord came, called his 12, set them aside, he said, do not go to the Gentiles. Matthew 15, Syrophoenician woman come to him, said, my daughter is grievously vexed by a devil. He said, it's not meet to take the food of the children and give it to dogs. All right? What changed? You see, you have to ask yourself questions like that. That helps you understand, put it in perspective. What changed? John the Baptist could have been Elijah. I mean, that's what you're talking Exactly, be a light to lighten the Gentiles, said in the book of Isaiah. All right? So what, I'm, what, he say, what our brother's saying is that there's a conditional thing going on here, and we talked about that last Sunday. Conditional. In other words, all the way up to the book of Acts, last chapter, 65, 60, 65, 69 A.D., before the 70 A.D. with Titus, during this period of time, Israel's relationship with God was conditional <coughs> upon them accepting the Messiah. They didn't accept him. They rejected him. All right. What did he do? Well, according to the book of Romans chapter 11, God blinded them. He blinded the Jews. And he quotes the Apostle Paul, who wrote Romans 11, quotes the same scripture he quotes here. And that same scripture is quoted a number of times in the Gospels. And every time that scripture is quoted, something profound happens as it relates to Israel's relationship with God. Are you following me on this now? It's important to understand this. And the scripture that's quoted is Isaiah chapter 6. If you'll take your Bible, you can do that when you get home. Just go through and look at it. i got a lot I want to cover here, but look at it, read it. You'll see that it has a direct reference to Israel believing on their Lord, their Messiah, either receiving or rejecting Him. And because they rejected Him, uh, God gave them blindness. Isaiah chapter number 6. He blinded them. Judicial blindness, we call it. And that's where they are today. To this very day, Israel is blinded. The Apostle Paul said in the reading of the law, the reading of Moses, to this day, they're blind. They're blind. They cannot see the Lord Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. If you can ever get a, a, a Jew to look at Zechariah chapter number 12 and say, that's Jehovah. The Jew will say, yeah, that's Jehovah. There's the Tetragrammaton, Yod, Hey, Vow, Hey, there's Jehovah. Well, then who is the me that was pierced? 
the antecedent of me is Jehovah. And the Jew has to scratch his head and think, now, you mean to tell me that God was pierced? When was he pierced? He was pierced on the cross. That makes Jesus God. You got it? Amen. You got it? You got it? You got it? Is Jesus God? Yes. You better believe he is. Thomas said, my Lord, my God. Yes. He never rebuked him. <laughs> no, no, no. When they fell at the Apostle Paul's feet, he got real nervous and said, get up. When they fell at Peter's feet, he did the same thing. But when they fell at the feet of Christ, he left them there. <laughs> because he's God. All right. So now Israel's blinded. What do we do? Well, God called Saul of Tarsus. And it's so very important to understand this. He called Saul of Tarsus. Look at John 11. This was the prevailing uh, the prevailing theology, eschatology, I get that'd be the best thing to say of it, eschatology. Theology, let me say this about theology. Uh, it has two meanings, two basic meanings. Theos, all right, ology is the wisdom of, study of, love of, God, the study of God. Theology, greater, have you ever heard of a systematic theology? You ever heard of a systematic theology? You, you've probably heard it. Systematic theology covers pneumatology, Christology, hamartiology, eschatology, uh, all of the ologies. It falls under the greater heading of theology. But theology itself is a study. What is it? It's the study of God. See, theology proper is the study of God himself. Theology, theos, is the Greek word for God. Eschatos is the study of last things. All right, look at their doctrine of last things in John 11. This is important. John chapter number 11 and verse number uh, 24. Look at verse 23, what the Lord stated, and look at Martha's response. John 11, 23. Jesus saith unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. She certainly believed that, but look where she put it. Look at this carefully. Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. See that? Now, have you ever heard of amillennial or postmillennial? You've heard of premillennial, postmillennial, amillennial. Ah means no, post means after, pre means before. What? Millennium. The idea is that by a lot of them, they believe that the church is going to bring in an era, era of peace, tranquility, and joy on the earth, and that at the end of that, when the earth has been converted to Christ, then the Lord comes back and He judges mankind, sheep on the right hand, goats on the left. That's a kind of a simplistic way of explaining what some believe. Others believe that there will be a no millennium, that's awe, that, uh, that the earth is essentially just going to get Wicked, more wicked, corrupt, and God's going to come and He's going to judge mankind. And that's it. The premillennial believes that the earth is wicked, corrupt, will remain corrupt, and not change until the Prince of Peace comes, who is righteous. And when the righteous one comes, righteousness brings peace. There is no peace without righteousness. And when He comes, He's going to reign on this earth for 1,000 literal years. That's premillennial. I believe that. Because this earth has never seen a time like that in the past. I cannot spiritualize it and explain it away. It just won't work. So in Martha's mind, the Lord's going to come back at the last day and the resurrection is going to take place. Now, he said something to her that blew her mind. You know, the resurrection to her was an event. It's when the dead rise when they come forth, okay? Now, when do the dead come forth? When do they rise? <laughs> Something strange happened when Christ arose. How many remember that? What does it say? What does it say? What's the wording? What's the wording? The wording's important. How does the Bible say it? Many bodies of the saints walk through the streets of Jerusalem after his resurrection. All right. For three days, the earth. The Bible, when he died, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, all right, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, what happened to the earth? Not only was it darkened where they were, something else happened. 
a quake. All right, that's when Judas Iscariot, who had hung himself just prior to that, he was swinging on a tree. When that earth quaked, would an earthquake be capable of toppling a tree? And the scripture says that he fell forth and his bowels gushed out. All right, that's what happened to Judas. In plainer words, when Christ said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit, to tell us it's finished, it's over, it's done. And he gave up the ghost. The earth shook. And at that very moment, Judas fell. And at that very moment, the graves were opened. The graves were opened. That's what it says. But they didn't come out of those graves. No, no, no. The graves were open. One runs back and, said, and says to the family, the sepulcher's open. Granddaddy is exposed. His body's out there. We're going to have to stand guard for these animals or something comes and they tear into his flesh. We can't have that. For three days, they watched those graves, all right? And on the first, that Easter Sunday morning, anytime after midnight, Christ arose. He arose not on Saturday. He arose on the first day of the week, which is the eighth day. He's the beginning. When he arose... They were standing guard at the graves. Many, not all, many bodies of the saints arose and walked through the streets of Jerusalem. Amen. What did that do? That confirmed to them where they were because they were associated with his resurrection. He is the resurrection. He said in John 11, I am the resurrection and the life. So when he came forth, they came forth. And they walked through the streets. Now they had to go back where they came from. They had to go back, just like a Lazarus. Lazarus died two times because he didn't take him with him. When he, le when he left this earth, for 40 days he was on it. And then he left, jo Acts chapter number 1. All right? That is the very beginning, the precursor of what the resurrection is about. It's about Christ himself. I am the resurrection, John 11 and the life. The time is coming, the hour is coming when all that are in the grave shall hear the voice of who? The Son of God and come forth. All they that have done good to the resurrection of life, they that have done evil to the resurrection of what? Damnation. So therefore it is the voice of the Son of God who is the resurrection. Now he arose from the dead, ascended to heaven. He ascended by his own power and his own righteousness, seated at the right hand of the Father. That's where he was when Saul of Tarsus was saved. Waiting for what? Waiting for the second advent, the second coming of Christ. Christ was seated at the right hand of the Father. The Jew was still being offered the kingdom. The earth was, what was happening was a transitional period and a, and, and, and a uh, what's the word for it? Conditional, transitional, uh, variation, a possibility. And all of this. But when he called Saul of Tarsus, he gave him something that nobody knew anything about. Look at 1 Corinthians 15. Verse In 1 Corinthians 15, he said, Behold, I show you a mystery. All right. So it's obvious that what he's talking about, Martha didn't know anything about. He said, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. How? In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. At the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Notice that there is no lost resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15. The unsaved are not coming up. Look at the book of Ephesians, which some believe, and you can take it for what it's worth, was the very first book ever written in the New Testament. It was written before Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John was written. Some believe that. I have no reason not to believe it. Say, so why? 
Because Paul, Saul of Tarsus, was called as a minister, as an apostle to the Gentiles. The Gentiles. All right? To the Gentiles. Look at First Corinthians, I mean, Acts, uh, Ephesians 5. Uh, <laughs> First Thessalonians, I've got, my mind's a little foggy today. Sometimes I leave the house and don't take it with me. I need to go back and say, <laughs> now mind, <laughs> catch up, yeah. <laughs> First Thessalonians 4, <laughs> I'll be saying one thing, my mind off over here somewhere else, and I need to get them together. All right, 1 Thessalonians 4, <clears throat> And verse number 13, it is 1 Thessalonians, not Ephesians, that many believe was the first book the Apostle Paul wrote. All right? 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. He uses a euphemism. What is that? That simply takes the sting away from it. I would not have you to be ignorant concerning them which are dead. Well, Christians aren't dead. If they are ever referred to as dead, they're dead in Christ. See, the dead in Christ. In Christ, they don't die, they live. All right. So he says here, I would not have be ignorant concerning them which are asleep. You sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. If we believe that Jesus died and rose again. I believe that. Do you believe that? Yes. Even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God raise from the graveyard. See, I put my private interpretation in there because there's a lot of folks that believe they sleep out here in the graveyard. What did he say? What does it say right here? He'll what now? He'll bring them with him. I said that to a dear old lady over 30 years ago. I said that one scripture right there. I quoted it to her. She'd been in church all her life. She was in her 80s. She had never seen that. And it's obvious that she had always been associated with amillennial or postmillennial teaching. To bring them with him means that they are somewhere with him. The apostle said to be absent from the bodies to be where? In the graveyard? No, present with the Lord. He said, I have a desire to part and be with Christ, which is far greater. That's where you are. You're with him. That is if you're born again. So, the dead in Christ, he'll bring with him. But you have to understand, well, then what's coming up from the grave? 1 Corinthians 15, what's coming up out of the ground? The person's not coming from the ground. The body comes up from the ground. It is sown a terrestrial body. Terra in Latin means of the earth. Terra, terrestrial. All right. It will be raised a celestial body. Celestial means of the stars of the heavens, of heaven. It will be raised that kind of body. It is sown corruptible. It is raised incorruptible. It is sown dishonorably or in a dishonor, but it is raised in honor. The apostle said he will change my vile body to be likened to his glorious body. The New Testament never says anything good about the body. I'm sorry. <laughs> Nothing good about it. He said in my flesh, which is his body, Go read Romans, the first seven chapters of Romans. I've read, I've read Romans now in the last two or three weeks, uh, at least uh, three or four times, the first few chapters especially, to try to get a real sense on what Paul's saying. And he's making it very clear. The body is corrupted. And the brain that you're thinking with right now is part of the body. It's part of the flesh. It's a fleshly brain. It can be used to think on spiritual things, to have your mind renewed, Romans 12, but it's still a flesh thing. Your brain is. So he said, in my flesh, is your brain part of your flesh? Yes, it is. Dwelleth no good thing. So what do I do? I have a conundrum here. I have a dilemma. What am I going to do about my flesh? You have to have the mind of Christ. And that can only come by spiritual renewal. First of all, by the new birth, and then by spiritual renewal, by the power of the Holy Spirit, shedding light on the Word of God and fill that brain full of Scripture and spiritual truth. Then you begin to think like God thinks and see things the way He does. So the body's vile, it's corrupt, it's corruptible, must put on incorruption. Think of it this way. 
You are a spirit being. If you're born again, you've been born of the Spirit of God. Otherwise, you simply have the spirit of life in you, which the unsaved man has, because all life comes from God. And you are living in a body, communicating through a soul, intellect, emotion, and will. That's what you're doing. So when you, spirit being, the spirits of just men made perfect, it says in Hebrews, when you, spirit being, come with the Lord Jesus Christ back from glory, he will raise up a glorified body likened to his glorious body. And his glorious body is something to behold. I'll tell you that right now. On this earth, his body appeared to be the body of a man. He took part of the same, the Bible says, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death. Christ had to die. But how is God going to die? It's impossible for God to die, but he became a man. That's the advent. That's the incarnation. And they couldn't kill him. They couldn't take his life. He had to lay it down. But he picked it back up again on the third day. That's the body we will have. He could appear with the disciples. They showed up one morning, and there he was with fish on the fire after his resurrection, sat down and ate with them. That's the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Our body will be likened to his glorious body. When does that take place? That takes place when he comes to take you to be with him. John 14, he prophesied of the rapture, but he didn't call it that. What does it say in John 14, verse 1? You believe in God? Believe also in me. For my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again to receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. That doesn't sound like he's coming back to put a kingdom on this earth. It sounds to me like he's coming back to get them. Right? That's a preview of the rapture. But nobody understood it to mean that. They just simply thought, well, the Lord's going to come back. All right? So who then had this mystery revealed to him about the rapture? Mm -hmm. Saul, Saul of Tarsus. I'll show you a mystery. Now, why did God wait to give him that mystery? That's a good question, don't you think? Yes, sir. John 11 is loaded. Sure, it's loaded. <laughs> He sure did. It's about not only the death of Jesus to save Israel, but that all of the righteous of the earth might be gathered together into one. That's the one body. Yes, it is. And he didn't even know what he's talking about. No, but he used an unsaved man yeah. to say it. Yeah. He certainly did. That shows the sovereignty of God. Yeah, it did. Yeah. When they prophesied the Old Testament, these things, the Bible said plainly that they desired to look into them. Peter did. Peter said that and could not because it wasn't time for them to understand it. The rapture's in the Old Testament. The first type of it's Enoch. You know, 60, uh, uh, what does it live? 365 years? I believe that's what it was. And uh, he, had, he had an appearance with, of... Uh, of, uh, of the Lord and, and for 300 years he walked with God and then God came in and all of a sudden took him. He, began, he prophesied. Enoch prophesied in the book of Jude. It says, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. Jude prophesied that. And he prophesied it for hundreds of years and then he was taken. All of a sudden he was not for God took him. Not even a body to bury. <laughs> he was gone. Okay. Yes, he was. He was the seventh, wasn't he? He was the seventh from Adam. His name means initiation or teaching, Enoch. 777 years. Uh, from Adam, from the creation, 777 years. So chronologists have got that marked down and numbered right down to the day, huh? Well, I wouldn't try to dispute it. That's, that's 777. That's the completion. <laughs> uh, Enoch. He had a son, didn't he? 
Who was his son? What did he name his son? You know what that means? Something. When he is gone, it will come. When he is dead, it will be sent. Has to do with something's going to happen when Methuselah leaves here. All right. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. He also used her as an object lesson. Here's a Gentile coming out of ignorance and darkness, yet she believes more than you standing around me. Yeah. Here you are. The He said, you God simply say the word, my servant will be healed. <laughs> uh, he, uh, you can go a little further with that. We run out of time here, but you can go a little further with that because what he's doing is saying here, he said, I have other sheep that have not this flock, you know. And he said, if, uh, if the Sodom and Gomorrah had, had the preaching you've had, they'd long since repented. You know, uh, the idea is that you're children of light. You've got the book, the canons and all that and the prophets, but look what you've done with it. Now, what are they going to do with it? And that's, uh, that's, that's another issue. We've run out of time. Let's have a word of prayer. We'll let you go. Brother Roger Lee, will you dismiss?